you know, we always start by saying that, you know, disability is not sort of something inherent that creates the poor outcomes that we see, you know, low college attendance rates, low employment rates, and so on. But at least, you know, some significant portion of it has to do with lack of oppor equal opportunity, with discrimination, and so on. So we're going to talk about today how uh, disabled folks have pushed back, um, and really, it's their it's their work. Um, I'm the parent of a child with a disability. I have a disability myself, but and everyone who works at Dredf has a disability or a child with a disability or can check multiple boxes, um, but we are, are going to talk about sort of where we came from. And I'll start this by saying, if you are, in fact, the relative, a grandmother, grandfather, parents, friends um, of someone with a disability, especially a child with a disability, uh, I hope that one of the things you'll take away tonight is that we need to keep carrying the torch forward and doing this work. We need to empower our young people uh, to keep doing this work. Uh, the motto of the disability rights movement is nothing about us without us. And so um, that's really where we're coming from. All right. So the, the reality is that people with disabilities in the United States until fairly, you know, kind of a remarkably short time ago, if you think about it, uh, have faced really erasure, um, institutionalization, been pitied. Um, been, you know, trotted up on stages for fundraising and so on. Um, we call it sometimes, uh, you know, uh, compassion, you know, or, or disability porn. Um, just, just this idea that, you know, there's really nothing worse that could happen to you. And, oh, good. Participation has enabled translation. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it's, it was driven by the sort of anxiety about disability uh, to, you know, just make the problem go away. And, you know, probably the most powerful story I ever heard about this was, of course, Judy Human, who recently passed away. And she talked about how, you know, as a child who was a wheelchair user, um, she, her mother pushed her up to school on the first day of kindergarten. And uh, they were told that she couldn't come into school because she was a fire hazard. So, you know, and one of the things she often says is, uh, safety is always a reason that is a really easy way to keep people segregated. Oh, it's just not, it's just not safe. Um, and so we, we saw that. And these sort of horrifying pictures are of children's institutions. Um, and it really was the norm. Uh, I lived up the street growing up in East Oakland, um, one of seven kids. And down the street from us was a family who had eight children but really there were nine. I had no idea they had a child with Down syndrome until I was a teenager and I saw her at some point. So she just never went out. She did not go to school and so on. So again, we've made a lot of progress. We have a long way to go. Um, in the 1940s and 50s, what started to happen is that after World War II, veterans began to return home and you know, demanding jobs and employment. You know, they just served their country. They had you know, come home and they were finding that there was no safety net for them. And so they began to lobby for uh, not just treatment for their you know, health care needs, but for access to their lives. And that's really where we, we all started. Um, I won't play this in the interest of time, but I wanted to include the link for you because we will be sending you the presentation. Um, but this is a line from a folk song in the 1960s uh, by Carolyn Hester, who had a sister with a disability. And she uh, sings about how, you know, my little sister Donna was sent to school today. They locked the door behind her and they threw the key away. Um, and that was, you know, really pe people were told when their children were born with obvious dif differences, disabilities, um, limb differences, uh, Down syndrome, whatever it was, that the best and kindest thing they could do to keep their family, quote, normal, would be to sort of erase the child, send them to an institution, and, and that was it. And that really was the norm. So, you know, I want to start by saying, you know, there's a lot of disability ancestors, and we're not going to go through tonight and, and you know, name them all. We could, we could do that in a semester-long class, and that would be a really fun class, I think. 
Um, but I do want to start by saying, you know, Frederick Douglass, uh, the the former slave who turned, uh, you know, just was incredibly eloquent about the impact of racism and slavery on people, said, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And I think, you know, that is one of the key takeaways when you're thinking about the disability rights movement. Um, people had to demand, put their bodies and their spirits on the line and demand to be part of things. Um, and it was pretty incredible. So for example, where I work in Berkeley, we are lucky enough to be located in the Ed Roberts campus, which is an incredible accessible building. Um, Ed Roberts is sometimes called the father of the independent living movement. So he was the first student at UC Berkeley to attend you know, with significant disability. In fact, he, his, there was no way to accommodate him in the dorm at the time in the 60s. And so he, uh, his dorm was the hospital. He'd had polio as a child. Um, and he went on to do just incredible things um, and do them with a lot of feistiness and zest and humor um, and really bitter sarcasm at times. Um, but he just called people out on, you know, this is not about me. This is really about you. This is about lived environments and lived realities. Um, and I also just wanted to point out another one of my disability heroes as we go through tonight, just wanted to give you some context. And that's Alice Wong, who is, you know, currently writing away. Her disability visibility blog is incredible. So I've included information about her and it here. Um, but we, you know, there are many, many people who have found through living with a disability uh, that the best way to address the obstacles they face is by challenging. Uh, the status quo and what people think of as normal and this idea that you should like make yourself invisible, pretend to be normal, and so on. So this call really, the disability rights movement really came out of the civil rights movement. And, you know, it goes all the way back. And the idea was that we're not, you know, as a society, we shouldn't discriminate on the basis of race or gender or religion in terms of who can get a job, public accommodations, who gets federal money. And it really, I, I think of it as starting even a little bit sooner than the 60s back in 1954 with the very important Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, that said that you know, segregation in public schools of black children and white children was uh, not legal and that because inherently separate is not equal. Um, and that's really, you know, that, that movement really, I think, was a catalyst for many folks living with disability and, and parents of children with disability, too, um, about, you know, how, how, why are we accepting this? You know, where do we go from here? How do we, how do we get, use this kind of a, a strategy and advocacy to make sure that we can have the lives we want instead of the lives that we're, we're being handed? So <clears throat> in the 1970s in the United States, oh. excuse me, um, we saw the first disability laws and the first independent living centers, um, which are still an incredible resource today. Um, the idea that you create a community of people, everybody shares, you know, how do you get through the system? How do you access these public benefits? How do you, you know, lobby to make sure that a bus will have a, a, a lift and so on? Um, how do you navigate the environment? Um, it was also in the 1970s that we first saw schools opening to children with disabilities in a meaningful way. Um, so not saying you can go to school if you can pretend you don't have a disability, if it was one that was invisible, um, and or uh, you can, you know, come to school if basically if you're, you know, not a safety, fire hazard, problem, etc. Um, and the other piece of this that's so important is I think that one of the early things that the disabled activists recognized was that it had to be a cross disability movement that could, you know, having a, a, a movement for social justice and civil rights that was focused on, you know, people with autism, you know, people with, uh, who, who are wheelchair users and orthopedic impairments, or, um, that that was not the way to go because there is power in unity and the barriers might be different, but the, but they're, there and they're very real and they ha were having a tremendous impact on people's lives. So yeah, that, that decision early on, I think was one of the, the best strategy decisions um, that happened. 
So, you know, I think it's really important for us to recognize that the history of disability rights in the US is really about struggle, it's about pushing back, and it's also about laws and policy and court cases and, you know, creating a moment. And there's a quote later on in the presentation from Judith Human, who people call sometimes uh, the mother of the disability rights movement, um, <clears throat> about, you know, how, you know, it starts slowly and little by little, you know, you're pushing, you don't accept, you, you question, you put your foot down um, or your hand down. Um, you are willing to put yourself on the line and put your community on the line in order to access those rights. And as time goes by, there starts to be momentum. And there are some key moments in the disability uh, history movement that I think were particularly notable, but it's really important to remember that they didn't just happen spontaneously. Um, there was so much work that went into organizing and thinking about these events that even though they may have happened in the moment, um, I think about the 504 sit-ins that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Uh, nevertheless, the groundwork was being laid in the courts, in the schools, in the community, in the activism of, of many people and the simple everyday acts of you know just not accepting the status quo. Um, so people started recognizing that there were some really unfair laws, practices, and so on, and that they needed to be addressed. And it was people with disabilities who pushed initially. Um, and I, I love this photo because you know I think that we often have this what I call, you know, the, the, the pity model, the poor little thing model. And I tell parents when I'm training them, you know, watch out for the poor little thing model, because this idea that, you know, someone who is disabled is, you know, worthy of our compassion and pity um, <clears throat> and is such a hero. <clears throat> if I see another uh, young person with Down syndrome who's crowned prom queen or prom, prom king, um, just because the other students want to feel good about themselves, um, I, I'm just going to lose it. Um, so we want people participating because they're equal members of society, not because we feel sorry for them and want to give them a special opportunity. So let's talk about the laws because this is, you know, this was really where the, a lot of the fight happened and especially at the federal level, because by fighting at the federal level, you're impacting the lives of people in all the states and territories. And, and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. There are four laws that um, are focused on the protections and um, rights of people with disabilities. <clears throat> the first one I'm gonna talk about is section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. It's a mouthful. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the federal law that creates special education. It's currently called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It wasn't always. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act, which, you know, as you can see, you know, each of these is sort of sequentially happening and expanding rights little by little by little. And people are using these rights to challenge in court, to challenge discrimination, to challenge um, not being able to access housing or transportation or whatever. So, um, but a lot of work went into making sure that these laws were not only passed, but implemented. So let's talk about 504. So section 504, so remember this is 1973 and there was you know a couple of years of work that went into getting uh, this, this act passed, says that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall solely because of their disability be excluded from the participation in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving financial federal financial assistance. So you cannot put your hand out for federal money and discriminate against people with disabilities, just like you can't discriminate on the basis of sex or race or religion. Um, and that that was really the intention. And Section 504 applies to all of us. Um, it's not uh, often par parents, when I'm talking to them, will think that it's only an education thing. It's not an education law. It's an anti-discrimination civil rights law. And it was quite a fight to get it implemented. And it's really a remarkable story that is not typically taught in our schools. Um, my child who attends Berkeley High 
where they have a wonderful uh, sort of diversity and ethnic studies requirement and for first year freshmen. It was, he started school in the first year of COVID um, high school and not one reference was made the entire year in that class to disability history, disability rights, or anything like that. So they talked about racism in housing, we talked about gender discrimination. And at some point <clears throat> I reached out to the department and they said, yeah, we, we sort of are aware of it, but we, we need to work on it, but you know, we have so much to do and so on. Um, this is a really proud history that I'm gonna talk about right now. And every student should know this history. So <clears throat> one of the people who was very involved in getting 504 implemented, Kitty Cohn, who was a, a dreadifer, um, has this quote that I really like. She said, you know, aside from so second to the signing of the regulations, the most important thing that came out of section 504 <clears throat> is the public birth of a, dis a disabled movement. So this was for many people, there was all kinds of groundwork going on, like we talked about um, with veterans coming home with parents lobbying for their children to go to school, with trying to deinstitutionalize people. Um, but really it was this moment where the disabled community stepped up that really was kind of that, that paradigm shift. Um, people all over the country, not just people shut in convalescent homes, but everyone in this country has learned that disabled people have a tremendous amount of strength that we're capable of leading a struggle that has won major gains for the government. So it was you know, a, a formidable um, challenge and it was a in pretty incredible outcome. 504, as I said, is a civil rights anti-discrimination law in jobs, in schools, in any you know, public entity that's receiving federal funds. Sometimes parents will say to me, well, you know, what about the after school program? And I say, you know, are they getting federal money? Find out um, because that's, that's the test. Um, and so it's got tremendous potential. It's actually monitored and the oversight is with the Office of Civil Rights because it is disability discrimination. It falls into the same category as all the other forms of discrimination that are identified in this country. I'm going to try to play just a little tiny bit of the power of 504, and I'm I'm hoping that it will work. If it does, sorry. If it if it doesn't work, the, the kid just came home. So, um, if it doesn't work, uh, the, the link is here, and Alyssa will send be sending you out these slides and so on. So let's see if we can get it to work. Can you hear it, Alyssa? Not yet. No. Not hearing. Okay. Sorry. All right. I'm going to stop it. I will stop it um, and just say that uh, there is a point in this video at about 19 minutes in that and normally I would have tested this, but I was a little under the weather today, um, where Judith Human, the, the mother of disability rights for many people, uh, is a, a young woman and they are uh, people are occupying the federal building in San Francisco and they were there for days and days. And uh, they were receiving all kinds of support from the Black Panther Party and the community. And they were just, and the issue was this, it's great that you passed the law, <clears throat> but you haven't implemented it. And the government's position at the time was, well, you know, we have to do the regulations and we have to work through a process and it takes time. And at some point, um, Judy says in, in tears, you know, we want it done now. We're tired of excuses. We're tired. And, you know, please stop smart, shaking your head like you like you uh, understand and agree with me. Uh, we this needs to get done and we demand that you get it done. So if you have a chance to watch this little video, it's it's short, um, but it's a wonderful uh, video about what actually happened in the sit-ins. Let me see if I can get myself back to my presentation. Okay. So, come on computer. All right. So the 504 sit-ins were a really pivotal, pivotal moment uh, because it, it was so visible. The media covered it. The idea that um, people with disabilities didn't sort of slink back into the shadows. They demanded their rights. 
they refused to leave the building. Um, many of them had you know, significant disabilities with all kinds of different access needs that they weren't able to you know, have met during that time, um, but they sat in and they sat in until finally the government gave in and said, okay, you know, we're gonna implement 504. And it was a moment of really seizing power. And I think again, especially for those of you who have uh, kids and young and young adults with disabilities, it's so powerful for them to see this history and to realize that, you know, it's not about waiting for somebody else to do it. Um, and in fact, the best people to do it are the people who are living it. And uh, 504 and the power of 504, this little video is a, a really powerful reminder of that. Once 504 was passed, so now we have public schools, right? And they can't discriminate now on the basis of disability uh, under Section 504. And so, you know, the door is starting to open up to the schoolhouse a little bit. Now a parent can claim, hey, you don't have a wheelchair ramp. And how does my child access education if there's no ramp? Um, and then little by little, drop by drop, you know, wait a minute, what about my child who has, you know, attention issues or problems with emotional regulation, for them a ramp might be a break or you know, some accommodations and some help and extra time. And so little by little, um, Section 504 started to become something that could be used in education and, uh, and other settings. Um, then in 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act was passed. So you can see that you know, 1973 is the uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Just two years later, we're getting, you know, now the momentum is building and we're getting this law uh, that says that children with disabilities have a right to a free, appropriate public education. And for those of you who don't know, all children in the United States have an entitlement um, to a free public education. So appropriate was the word that came in under um, the Education for All Handicapped Children. Um, and there were some very pivotal cases, one of which Dredef was very involved in called the Rachel Holland case. Um, that case, I've heard our former managing director, Arlene Mayerson, who still is um, you know, a part of our Dredef family and one of the founders of Dredef. Um, I've heard her talk about uh, the Rachel Holland case and educating us in the education advocate the Parent Training and Information Center. And, you know, it's so powerful because, you know, Rachel Holland was able to go to preschool and her preschool teacher at her preschool was able to testify to the Supreme Court about how, like, you know, she's just a kid. Um, she's doing what all the kids are doing, um, but the public school wasn't having it. And so it was really a fight to not segregate her and to let her go to her public school, but with support. So the IDEA, that which was initially called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, um, set the groundwork for that, that people could start to challenge it. Now there were rights. Now parents could push and say, you know, wait a minute, we have uh, procedural safeguards, which is just a fancy way of saying parent rights that are spelled out for us um, that we can use. So, you know, our kids need to go to school. How are we ever going to change things in this country? How are we ever going to have equal opportunity if we don't make sure that our children are educated and can go to college or go to work, you know, contribute to society in whatever way? Um, that they want to and that they're able to uh, without the barriers because somebody else has decided that they shouldn't. So what this law did <clears throat> was it gave children with disabilities the right to this free appropriate publication, uh, public education, as I said, by providing them with what's known as an individualized education program. And what's really radical about that, and I think sometimes we don't step back and think about this enough, is that because this law passed and because it gave families the right to advocate for their children and, and young people once they turned 18, the right to advocate for themselves, go to hearings and, and all that, this is one of the major ways that people with disabilities stopped being so invisible. Right. And so suddenly there were children with disabilities in public schools. There were children, you know, who looked or behaved uh, differently, um, who were in classrooms and learning. And, you know, it was, again, one of those pivotal moments. In 1990, the law was reauthorized and it was renamed the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. And that's what you often hear 
uh, it called today. But it comes out of way back in 1975, this idea that children, all children, are not only entitled to a free appropriate public education, but they're also entitled to participate in that education in the most typical, less least restrictive environment, um, and that any decisions about their education where they aren't part of that, they're just mainstream of the everyday school, have to be based on what their needs are, not based on you know, what the school policy is or whether somebody else is uncomfortable um, or doesn't know how to support them. It's been an incredibly successful law, despite the fact that I think, you know, for many of us in the PTIs and the LISIC could probably attest to this, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, trying to solve problems. Um, at the same time, I think we need to step back and recognize what we've accomplished. So again, with 504, here's a right that says, you know, disability is a minority group. Again, the largest minority group in the country. Um, if we live long enough, we're probably gonna join the club. Um, and we have a right to equal access to all the things that everybody else enjoys um, and to not be discriminated against. Um, now we have, you know, IDEA, the, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that says, um, now the United States Congress is going to help school districts, states and school districts fund um, the cost of special education. And so that, so that we can make sure we're doing this right. And it also sparked a lot of research about the benefits of inclusion and what kinds of strategies work best for children with disabilities and the credential program for teachers and so on. <clears throat> um, it gives parents and caregivers, when I use the word parent, I mean whoever has the legal responsibility, decision-making ability for a child. It gives uh, parents the power to push back and enforce the law. And again, um, you know, one of the things I love about Greta, because we are this, this organization that is consists of all people with disabilities and then the parents of children with disabilities, is that those two groups always haven't got along perfectly. Um, there have certainly been times when, you know, the disability rights movement is saying, you know, don't overprotect your kids, you know, let them try new things, let them take risks and so on. And, um, you know, no, we shouldn't just, you know, try to, um, you know, force behavioral compliance over you know, a meaningful quality of life. And so, you know, there's some tension there. But this idea that we endowed parents with the right to advocate for their children also made a bridge between, I think, the parents of children with disabilities and the, the now at that time, you know, pretty much budding, blooming disability rights movement and gave them a way to talk to each other and, you know, to really start rethinking what we should expect for our kids in public school. Um, and so the other thing that IDEA uh, did that's so wonderful is that they said to themselves, because a lot of advocates, a lot of parents, uh, a lot of youth you know, were saying, you know, it's great that you're passing a law that gives us all these rights. Uh, it's incredibly complex. How in the world will we ever use them? And so recognizing that Congress actually funded as part of IDEA, a parent training and information center, at least one in California, we have several. Um, and the purpose was to help parents know what their rights were and help young people as they became young adults because students can receive special education um, up until about 22 varies by state. Um, and so that the PTIs became, you know, all about making sure that parents learned what the possibilities were. You know, I think I was talking to a parent the other day in the park who has a child with a disability and she was saying that it was her first child and it was during COVID and she really didn't recognize the signs that her child, you know, might need some help and that was having some, some maybe developmental challenges. And because she had a friend who worked at a PTI, she was able to come to a training and learn that, you know, actually, even though your child's only three, they can be evaluated when they're three and so on. And so it really started this, you know, the, the most powerful thing in the world is paying it forward. Um, and the parent centers have really, have really worked on that. And the disability rights community has been instrumental in helping the parent centers understand what the what the long-term goals are. You know, the IDEA is not about getting your child through one year. 504 isn't about just making sure your child has an extra time, has some extra time for a test. These laws um, are really about making sure 
that your child has future opportunity for employment, education, independent living, community participation, and so on. Um, and you know, one of the most beautiful things I've ever read in a legal document comes out of the IDEA. It's it's in the the what the Congress said in this section that's shown here. Again, it's a live link; you can see it. Um, which is the statement that disability is a natural part of the human experience, and it in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. <clears throat> Improving educational results for children with disabilities is an essential element of our national policy of ensuring equality of opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency for individuals with disabilities. You know, and this work, you know, it, it continues. There's lots of other things I'm going to talk about going on. But this was really a whole new way of thinking about it. You know, it isn't, it isn't that there's this group of people who are so different um, and so uh, less than human, that we don't want to see them or think about them or we're going to lock them up in institutions. Instead, it was, you know, we're celebrating disability as a form of diversity. And, dis and diversity is, you know, uh, so a powerful way that we learn to live together in community and that we have in civil society. So before 1975, uh, about almost 2 million children with disabilities were excluded from public schools. And think about that for a minute. And that's probably a low number. <laughs> because a lot of kids were given up at birth or shortly thereafter. Um, and so I'm not sure that the count was really all that great. But what we know is that after this law was passed, we started seeing gains in some very key areas. And, um, and this then fed the disability, civil rights and activism movement because more disabled people were going to college, pushing back on employment and so on because they were having the benefit of these services. So now this is a 2021 number, um, more than seven and a half million children with disabilities receive services and support, um, almost 67 point something percent. So almost 67% of children with disabilities spend 80% or more of their day in the general education classroom with support pushed in as they need. Um, we also now provide early intervention services to more than 362,000 infants and toddlers with disabilities and their families. And we also support the transition to adulthood now where there's a requirement in the IDEA to make sure that we're preparing our young people for life after special education, general education and public school um, so that they're prepared to get out there and keep fighting the good fight and, and doing the work. Um, the graduation rates are nowhere near where we want them to be. Uh, I wanted to say as a quick aside that California has decided at long last that that putting people on a or students on a different track, a certificate of completion track, really uh, isn't in their best interest and has created uh, the requirement that most students will earn a high school diploma and IEP teams need to find ways to support students to do that. And the small percentage of students who have really significant Cognitive disabilities where they really, you know, need to use different standards can do that and still earn a regular high school diploma. And again, this is really rooted back in this early work, because uh, if you assume that a child, for example, who has an intellectual disability um, can't possibly um, graduate from high school and if you, you know, you're never working on the same state standards and you're never pushing for them to, you know, read and write and do math and also learn those social skills and those coping skills that kids learn in the classroom. Um, and then, then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because that young person isn't prepared. Um, and so IDEA has been really instrumental in making some of these changes. So graduation rates are still low. I think the national average for all students is around 87% or so. It really varies by state quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> But um, it's, it's moved up from 1990 when it was only 57% for students with disabilities. And again, this is cross disability. Really important to know that about 70% of all children who are served in our public schools who have an IEP are students who have a learning disability and they're you know, spending most of their day in, in general education. Um, and so uh, that rate has increased you know, more than 10 percentage points uh, since then, but we still have a lot of work to do in that regard. So just be aware that that's changing and expectations should be high for all students 
And how do we remove those barriers? How do we specialize that instruction and design it in a way that they can earn a diploma so that they can get the jobs and have the opportunities that a diploma really brings as a passport to adulthood. Um, and then finally, well, I'm gonna talk about the Fair Housing Act too, but you know, really the ADA um, is just transformative. Um, and, you know, when I first started learning about disability rights at DREDF, I really had the sense that I think a lot of people do that, you know, maybe the ADA was about people like suing because they tripped in a restaurant or something, you know, that it was about, I don't know, that there was something untoward about it or whatever. Um, then I read it um, and it's long. There's various titles to it and different, different kinds of um, areas, but it is so powerful in terms of changing the landscape. Uh, for people with disabilities. And it was signed in 1990 by President George Bush I. Um, I remember hearing, uh, again, Arlene Marison, our, one of our founding and, and directing attorneys, and uh, she was talking about the day the ADA was signed and, and uh, her colleague and fellow Dredifer Pat Wright was there. I'm not actually sure if Pat was with Dredif at that time, um, but they were quite a pair continue to be quite a pair. And um, she, she said that <clears throat> Ted Kennedy, uh, who they were sitting next to, sort of leaned over and said something to the effect, and I'm, I'm not going to quote directly, but um, you know they have no idea what they just did um, because they knew how powerful this law was going to be and how it was going to change things. So when you think about things like curb cuts for your stroller, baby stroller, um, you know, that comes out of the ADA. When we think about accessible buses for our seniors, when we think about, um, you know, a mammogram machine that, you know, should be able to reach down to do, um, uh, take a picture of a woman who's in a wheelchair expressed as well as somebody who can stand. All of those things are really tied to the ADA. And in, in many ways, it's very similar to Section 504, but much more defined and expansive. And you know, ADA came out of the fact that the US Congress recognized that people with disabilities were experiencing discrimination. Again, let's go back. You know, we know that in the, you know, prior to the 50s and early 60s, that people were often erased or just considered, you know, incapable, regardless of what their disability was. Um, and then we had 504, and then we have, you know, special education IDEA. Um, and so we're starting to have more people with disabilities empowered, educated. Um, we're starting to have people learning from what we might call their ancestors, um, the first disability civil rights folks um, and then the new generation coming up behind them. Um, and so at this point, it you know, really became possible for the Congress to recognize, to see the problem that a lot of the, the low employment rates and health problems and housing problems, that, you know, healthcare problems that people were facing were at least as much, if not more, tied to being discriminated against based, you know, decisions were made based on myths and stereotypes, that they were a result of physical barriers in the in the environment. Um, you know, you can't go to college at UC Berkeley if you can't access the buildings where your classes are. Um, and that there, these exclusionary policies were creating a lack of opportunity and barriers. And we're creating this situation where people were overprotected, segregated, and institutionalized. Um, <clears throat> one of the people who testified at the joint hearing on discrimination against the disabled as this law was going through the very slow process of getting passed in Congress um, said, you know, I worry that people will treat me differently because I'm blind, black, and female. So, you know, I'm checking off all these boxes and these are all forms of discrimination. Um, and I want to make sure that I have equal opportunity. Uh, it's probably one of the things that when you look at the history of the Americans with Disabilities, I'm sorry, the Ameri yeah, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, <clears throat> is, there's a very famous photo, here it is, um, for those of you who need a description, it's a picture of a little girl with a helmet on crawling up the steps of our Capitol building. Uh, her name was Jennifer, Jennifer Keelan. And, you know, basically she was part of a very large number of people who were so fed up about how long it was taking and wanted to create momentum to get this very important law passed. And so, you know, it was a, a real, they created a spectacle, you know, as activists, they, they, again, put their bodies on the line and they crawled up the Capitol steps to show just what barriers people faced 
um, but also to show just how capable and how determined people with disabilities were to change things. Um, and then finally, and I, you know, I just want to, I know we're, it's getting too close to time. Um, you know, the final protection is the US Fair Housing Act. And again, we, we recognize that there was discrimination on the basis of race. We recognize that there's discrimination sometimes on the basis of gender, especially back in the 60s and 70s, if you're a woman trying to buy a house. Um, but disability was another big issue. One of the first calls I took at Dredd up was a parent of a child with autism who was being evicted from her house that she rented because of her child's behavior and the other neighbors complaining and she you know, really needed help to, to deal with that problem. And so <clears throat> the Fair Housing Act provides those kinds of protections. So you know, we've come a long way. We have a lot longer to go. Um, and I'm just gonna end by quoting Judy Human. She said, uh, change, and she passed away just very recently. Um, so she said, change never happens at the pace we think it should. It happens over years of people joining together, strategizing, sharing, and pulling all the levers they possibly can, the levers of power. And gradually, excruciatingly slowly, things start to happen. And then suddenly, seeming out of the, seemingly out of the blue, something will tip. And so I hope your takeaway listening to this history and, and you know, follow the links to look, get more detail um, is that you, know, you realize that this is what we need to do as caregivers, as community members, as disabled people. Um, and we need to make sure that our kids know their own history so that they can get out there and start pushing as well.